Uh, good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us this morning for Winship Grand Rounds. Uh, if you are an Emory University or healthcare employee and you would like to receive CME uh, for this uh, hour, the login information can be found in the chat feature on the bottom of your screen. If you have any issues with the webinar or the CME login, please uh, send an email to Julie Hawkins or just drop us a note through the chat feature uh, below. Uh, this morning, we are very pleased and uh, privileged to welcome Dr. David Barbie. Uh, Dr. Barbie is a thoracic medical oncologist in the uh, Lowe Center for Thoracic Oncology at Dana-Farber Camps Institute and an associate professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School. He's also uh, the associate director uh, of the Balfour Center for Applied Cancer Science, as well as an associate member of the Broad Institute. Dr. Barbie earned his undergrad degree at Harvard College and his MD at Harvard Medical School. Uh, he was a Howard Hughes Medical Investigator Program Medical Student Research Fellow in Dr. Edward Hollow's lab at the MGH Cancer Center. He then completed an MGH Internal Medicine Residency and Chief Residency, uh, Dana-Farber Partners Oncology Fellowship, and he performed postdoctoral work in Dr. William Hahn's lab at Dana-Farber and the Broad Institute. Currently, he is a principal investigator in his own laboratory at Dana-Farber, uh, while also seeing patients uh, in the Lowe Cancer Center, in the Lowe Center for Thoracic Oncology. Dr. Bobby's research has a strong translational focus uh, studying the role of innate immunity in lung cancer. His early collaborations with Gilead Sciences led to the first TBK1 inhibitor trials uh, using a repurposed multi-targeted JAK inhibitor he was principal investigator of a multi-center lung cancer clinical trial using this first generation drug, and his work also led to similar studies in colorectal and pancreatic cancer. Currently, his laboratory is developing ways to co-opt TBK1 signaling to drive an antiviral response that can boost the impact of cancer immunotherapies. As a fellow, Dr. Barbie received an ASCO Young Investigator Award and an NIH K08 grant. Since starting his laboratory, he has also received an American Society for Clinical Investigation Young Physician Scientist Award and was elected as an ASCII member in 2019. Currently, he is a principal or co-principal investigator on multiple NIH grants, including an R01, P01, and two U01 grants. He has also received significant funding from the V Foundation, Stand Up to Cancer, the Mark Foundation, the Ludwig Center, and the Parker Institute for Cancer Immunotherapy. And besides this tremendous scientific achievement, I would like to emphasize that Dr. Bobby is a superb clinician, and I would like to cite one of his patients from the uh, review on the Dana-Farber website. And that patient said, I am regarding Dr. Barbie as more in just than just my physician. I see him as a friend at this point. His bedside manner and the care and comfort he shows to me as a patient is exceptional. It is so important to feel that the person on the other side really cares and is, in fact, a human being. I am so blessed to have him as my physician. And we are very blessed to have you here with us today, Dr. Barbie, and we look forward to hearing about restoring lung cancer immunogenicity. Turning it over to you. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that very kind introduction. And yeah, actually, I'll say that, you know, in this field, um, as we're often challenged uh, writing papers and grants and getting rejected often, um, uh, patient comments really uh, keep me afloat. And um, I would say it's the most important thing that we do. Um, so, um, yeah, so thank you again. I'm, uh, again, a thoracic oncologist at Dana-Farber and run my own lab um, now for a little over 10 years. Um, and we've had a long-standing focus, as you mentioned, um, in innate immunity in lung cancer. And I'll give a little bit of background how we've evolved. And so, while, as mentioned, we are initially interested in trying to suppress this response, and on the next slide, I'll explain why, um, what we've become very interested in since the advent of immune checkpoint blockade is understanding distinct subgroups um, of lung cancers that fa uh, fail to respond um, as would be expected and understanding the mechanisms why, because if we can really understand the underlying um, mechanisms, then we can target them much better. Um, and so the two types that I'm going to focus on are within non-small cell lung cancer uh, that's driven by oncogenic KRAS is the subgroup that has commutation of LKV1. Um, and as a, a number of you may be familiar and who uh, work on lung cancer, uh, that there uh, was this very nice paper now several years ago as part of the um, large Stand Up to Cancer Consortium, also work from Merck Oncology and many other companies found the same thing, that basically LKV1 loss in non-small cell lung cancer 
predicts checkpoint blockade resistance. But I think what's less appreciated is that um, in small cell lung cancer, despite the uh, FDA approval of first line immunotherapy combined with chemotherapy, it really responds poorly overall uh, to checkpoint blockade. And I think this table here, um, that, or this graph here that was uh, from the New England Journal now several years ago, highlights this also very well. And that just like KRAS mutant lung cancer, small cell lung cancer is almost universally associated with tobacco use and smoking, and so has a high tumor mutation burden. Yet, for a given plot, if you plot tumor mutation burden versus response to checkpoint blockade, you can see up in this upper right corner that high TMB tumors like cutaneous squamous cell, mismatch repair uh, cancers do respond, and melanoma. Um, whereas in low, um, like pancreatic cancer, low TMB tumors don't respond. But you can see here that small cell lung cancer falls off this curve, that it has a relatively high tumor mutation burden, but a relatively low response rate to small cell lung cancer. And we'll get into that um, a little bit later. But as was mentioned, we've had a very long standing interest in this target, um, TBK1. It's a kinase and is druggable. Um, and for the, for the first uh, number of years, what we were very interested in is blocking this aspect of uh, signaling TBK1. Um, is a homolog um, of the I-kappa kinase family. It's what's called a non-canonical I-kappa B kinase, which phosphorylates I-kappa B and leads to NF-kappa B uh, activation. But what was recognized early on is that there's another substrate of TBK1, uh, which is actually even more direct, more potent substrate, which is IRF3. Um, however, we rarely saw activation of IRF3 in KRAS mutant lung cancers. We really saw preferentially the NF-kappa B arm. But what has become apparent now over basically the last 10 years is there's been an incredible definition of the pathways um, that sense viruses. Um, and the one that I'm gonna focus on today for the majority is the pathway that senses DNA viruses and double-stranded DNA. And why this is particularly interesting um, is that um, once double-stranded DNA from your own cell, either the nucleus or the mitochondria get leaked um, or actually endogenous retroviruses, um, that convert into double-stranded DNA, they also can get sensed by this pathway. And the uh, enzyme that was really only discovered um, eight or nine years ago um, that detects the double-stranded DNA is an enzyme called CGAS, or cyclic GAMP synthase. And this produces a second messenger um, that links um, uh, GTP and uh, ATP to a molecule called cyclic GAMP. And this binds to this protein um, known as Sting, that is typically localized and sequestered in the endoplasmic reticulum. But in response to a very strong double-stranded DNA synthesis, generation of CGAMP, activation of Sting, this now translocates to this space uh, near the Golgi. And um, what a number of people have shown now is that this serves as a platform to recruit IRF3 to TBK1. And so, so think about it, so it's redirecting TBK1 away from NF-kappa B towards this um, IRF3 and really rewiring its activity to drive a very potent uh, type one interferon uh, response. And we'll get into a lot of details as to why this is important, um, but as opposed to an NF-kappa B response, which promotes IL-6, cell survival, um, an interferon response activates STAT1, which is pro-death, blocks translation, um, but also very importantly, um, activates chemokines that can recruit T cells and can upregulate MHC class one. And so what we found now several years ago, and I'm not going to talk in too great a detail about it because um, we published it now several years ago, um, is that the subtype of KRAS mutant lung cancer that I just mentioned that resists checkpoint blockade, what we found is that it silences sting and, and that this had actually also been discovered now in melanoma and several other uh, uh, cancers. Um, it, for example, HPV um, had a neck cancer as well as ways that uh, tumors can evade um, this innate immune um, interferon response. And so basically what we found is that we'd had this longstanding interest in studying KRAS mutant lung cancer and had been studying TBK1 activity and we decided to block for sting levels and found this very surprising finding that basically KRAS P53 mutant cell lines had intact sting, whereas the LKB1 uh, null cell lines um, lost uh, sting expression. We saw that there were some that were completely absent and some that had very low sting levels, but um, definitely suppressed relative to KRAS P53. And so one might wonder, is this happening at the protein level or the messenger RNA level? And um, just here, I'm just showing qPCR, but basically you can see that it's messenger RNA um, that is suppressed for sting um, in KRAS LKB1 mutant cells. 
And we went on to show that this is happening at the epigenetic level and involves actually two different enzymes, EZH2, uh, but then there's also a second layer of silencing that can happen in these absent cells related to DNMT1. And this was not just a cell line artifact that if we went back and stained tumors um, for sting levels, what you can see um, is that stromal cells um, stain positive for sting in KRAS LKB1 mutant lung cancer. So you have a positive control, um, but tumor cells were either absent or had very low level staining in contrast to KRAS P53 uh, uh, tumors. And so one question is why, why would this happen? Why would KRAS LKB1 mutant tumors try to silence sting? And so um, just to review some basic biology about LKB1, um, LKB1, one of its targets um, is canonical targets is AMP kinase. And AMP kinase, um, when it's phosphorylated, inhibits mTOR activity. So really the way that LKB1, uh, one of the ways that LKB1 functions as a tumor suppressor is that when you delete, when the tumor deletes LKB1 somatically or, or also in the germline syndrome, Ploetz Jaegers, that you get deregulated mTOR activity. What happens when you get deregulated mTOR activities, the cell thinks that it's nutrient sufficient, so it shuts off autophagy. And when you shut off autophagy um, and you have oncogenic KRAS and are dividing very rapidly, um, what can happen is you accumulate damaged mitochondria because autophagy is very important to restore um, through the process of mitophagy, uh, restore mitochondrial function. And so this is another well-known feature of KRAS LKB1 mutant tumors that they have very high reactive oxygen species um, and they often, therefore, also activate NRF2 signaling pathways to counteract the ROS. But uh, another thing that hadn't really been appreciated is that this also leads to DNA leakage um, into the cytosol. Um, and so that when you leak DNA into the cytosol, as I mentioned, it gets recognized by this enzyme C gas, produces the second messenger, activates sting, and now redirects TBK1 to its canonical substrate and drives this um, IRF3 STAT1 driven cytotoxic response, complicating these matters, and we don't have time to talk about it, but sting also is degraded by autophagy. Um, so you basically have this vicious cycle where you're activating the pathway and you're not able to degrade sting. And so the way cells get around it is they then silence it. So we believe this is a selective process that happens over time during tumor evolution um, to um, avoid this uh, response. And so just as some of the evidence that we showed um, in these cell lines that had very low levels um, of sting, that if you add back LKB1 here in an isogenic fashion, you can see that sting levels um, are restored to vary varying degrees. Um, and so then what we did was we treated with this double-stranded DNA, either in the context of the baseline cell line or restoring LKB1 and restoring sting, and what we saw was this reversal, that, that when we had always looked at cytokines, as I mentioned in these KRAS LKB1 lines, we saw activation of NF-kappa B cytokines like IL-6, IL-8 that are immune suppressive. However, now when you add back uh, LKB1 and stimulate with poly DADT, um, basically these are now suppressed. And now what you shift towards um, is CXCL10. And this is one of the, I'll get a lot into this later on, but this is one of the key, key uh, interferon targets uh, that is important for recruiting T cells. Um, and so you can see here, this is just validating this Luminex uh, broad data in this one cell line that across all these three cell lines, um, that when you now restore LKB1, stimulate with double-stranded DNA, you see this preferential shift in induction of the CXCL10 as well as type one uh, interferon um, itself. Hence, rewiring um, this innate immune signaling uh, back to activating uh, sting and IRF3. And so why, why might this be relative to anti-tumor immunity? Well, um, something that a number of groups had started to demonstrate as well, uh, along with this checkpoint block blockade, and, and then, you know, there's this sort of um, concept out there of uh, very vague concept for resistant tumors of sort of cold tumors or immune excluded tumors. And indeed, what we could see is that in the LKB1 null tumors that we had stained um, that were staying negative, um, here's the tumor um, stained in pink, but you can see that CD8 T cells were largely contained in intervening areas. And we saw very little T cell infiltration into the tumor um, itself. Um, whereas in the sting intact tumors that were LKB1 intact and P53 mutant, you saw a much greater degree of T cell uh, infiltration. And so we believe that this is related to what I just showed you, um, that if you're not making CXCL10, you're not drawing T cells into the tumor. 
Whereas if you now restore sting signaling, uh, now there's this homing that's coming from the tumor to bring in T cells. So we actually then tried to model this. Um, another large area of my lab is very interested in developing novel systems, um, moving beyond 2D culture. Um, this is a microfluidic device developed at MIT. This is a top-down view um, of a 3D system where basically this is a collagen block in the middle. So in this case, we can just take cell line spheroids um, that we're embedding uh, in collagen. And then we can take Jercat T cells um, and load them on this side media channel and then watch them migrate in towards, um, towards the tumor spheroid. And so basically we did this with this uh, same isogenic system that I mentioned. Red are the Jercat cells sitting on the side here. Um, green are the tumor spheroids that ultimately start to disperse and fill the well. And you can see here that if we add back LKB1 where we had restored sting, we maybe see a little bit um, here, there's very little T cell migration towards the tumors, tumor cells, um, but here maybe you get a little bit of uh, migration. But now what happens when we actually activate the DNA and the cytosol with a stimulus? So when we add the uh, poly DADT, which is this double-stranded DNA, you see, again, despite this very strong stimulus, very little migration, but now you see this dramatic infiltration into the uh, tumor spheroid. And again, what this strongly correlates um, is that these tumor cell spheroids are making CXCL10 and drawing T cells in towards them. In work that we just followed on, uh, Marco Campisi, um, who had developed this model system, um, he just published this last year. Um, what we're not really mimicking uh, in that system is the ultimate physiological barrier, uh, which is the vasculature. Um, and so we also believe, this is part of the U01 with Roger Cam, that we really need to start to develop models, um, both with primary tumor spheroids, and also here we're just showing um, cell line spheroids, where we actually incorporate vasculature. And I don't have time to um, go into this in great detail, but basically what Marco did is use this same very nice model, treating with poly DADT. And basically what he showed um, is that not only is that very simple concept of that here we have low CXCL10, so there's no source, whereas when you restore LKB1, there's CXCL10 drawing T cells in. But actually what happens when you reconstitute the pathway is that that upstream ligand, CGAMP, um, actually gets exported uh, from tumor cells as well. And um, actually one of the very early studies um, of these sting agonists or CGAMP-like molecules was that they can activate the vasculature. And so basically what we found is that um, what this does is it primes the vasculature, actually allow T cells to stick um, and start to extravasate. So we actually think then we're doing a lot further work on this currently, um, that part of this T cell exclusion is not only the lack of the uh, chemokines, uh, but also the lack of signals that are able to activate the vasculature. And so, so in summary, um, in this portion of the talk, um, what we found is that sting is epigenetically silenced in KRAS LKB1 mutant tumors. This correlates uh, with their intrinsic resistance to PD1 blockade, um, as well as the T cell excluded ph uh, uh, phenotype. And as I just mentioned, that we don't we think that it's not only important for T cell recruitment due to chemokines, but also um, due to vascular activation. Um, but what I also don't have time to talk about is we have a, a significant effort in the lab. Um, which the obvious um, outcome of this is that if we can restore sting expression and see gas uh, activity uh, in KRAS LKB1 tumor cells, we're going to now rewire and drive this chemokine response and drive CGAMP uh, production to reverse this um, um, immune cold uh, phenotype. Um, and so this is something we're actively working on uh, as well. Um, but what I want to spend the rest and the majority of the talk on is the second tumor type. This is work that we just published and we're also pretty excited about um, in small cell lung cancer. Um, and we had gotten into small cell lung cancer. Um, again, my lab largely studies RAS signaling. And so I, I really didn't see a reason why uh, to study um, small cell lung cancer, given that it mutates RB and P53. Until this postdoctoral fellow joined my lab, Israel uh, Kanyaras, uh, now a little more than five years ago. And he was from Barcelona. And what he had been studying was a phenotype that I actually hadn't even been aware of, that neuroendocrine cells um, that are derived from small cell lung cancer patients um, can sometimes attach, um, spontaneously attach to the plate uh, and look somewhat mesenchymal. 
Um, but what he found is that you can actually coax this phenotype uh, further. And this was actually a literature in the 1980s that Bruce Johnson, one of my mentors here, had mentioned that it, um, it had actually long been known that if you put RAS uh, in these cell lines, you could also drive this, this phenotype. Uh, but what Israel had done in his prior publication is use HGF um, to treat this H69 cell line uh, for two weeks. And what he found is that by just treating with HGF and stimulating some basal MET uh, signaling, you could derive these attached populations, which he called H69M for MET activated. And then once you did that, you could actually get rid of the HGF. And as long as you culture the cells at high enough density, um, you can maintain this mesenchymal um, subpopulation from the parental H69 uh, line. So then I became right, quite interested in this, uh, this phenotype because what we found is that um, this actually has RAS signatures uh, and actually um, secreted cytokines uh, uh, when, we, um, when we first joined the lab. So now I thought there was something quite interesting about this, this phenotype. And what we did was we, um, PD checkpoint blockade had just been started um, to be studied in small cell lung cancer. And so we decided to look at PDL1 levels um, uh, in these different populations. And basically what we found is that the neuroendocrine cells had zero PDL1. But what was really interesting is that this attached population, you can see it's already somewhat heterogeneous that yes, uh, there are some mesenchymal like cells, but there are still some rounded cells that look like the neuroendocrine cells. And we saw this dual population by flow in this H69M for PDL1. And when we sorted it, what we found was basically what PDL1 was marking was this pure mesenchymal subpopulation, whereas the PDL1 low um, population was still rounded but attached, or this hybrid population. Um, and then we became really interested, and my first question is, this is, a, is this a contaminant? Is this really small cell lung cancer? Um, but indeed, when we actually sequenced um, this, uh, this matched the H69 cell line. But what was very interesting um, about this uh, subpopulation, again, I don't have time to get into it, is that it was really mediated by an epi a very robust epigenetic um, state transition, where we found that basically um, there was a set of endogenous retroviruses that were derepressed um, due to a low EZH2 cell state, um, and that these rewired these cells, and these were the source of TBK1 activation and cytokines, um, not KRAS itself, but rather um, this TBK1 activation downstream of ERVs that was driving this cell state. Um, but what we found at this, this time, um, when we looked at the sensors of these, um, that, that there's, there's RNA sensors of the double-stranded RNA from these ERVs, but also we showed they could get con converted into double-stranded DNA. And what was surprising to us is that the RNA sensors really didn't vary um, between these different cell states but we saw this very robust tracking of sting levels that in the neuroendocrine cells, they didn't have sting. Um, in the mixed population, H69M, or here's a chemo-resistant version that's also mesenchymal, they express sting. But again, very interestingly, it tracks very closely with PDL1 that this pure mesenchymal population had recovered sting, whereas this PDL1 low uh, did not recover sting. And um, again, we didn't fully understand it at the time, um, but um, after we published this paper, Naveen Mahadevan, who is a postdoc, uh, uh, sorry, pathologist, uh, uh, I, was, I was telling Dr. Schneider, um, joined my lab um, and became interested. So Naveen um, is an MD, PhD, um, and you know, I like to say, um, hopefully I'm learning a lot more true immunology now, but I'm sort of an immunology pretender, uh, given that I moved from RAS signaling to innate immunity. Um, but Naveen actually um, trained um, at UCSD uh, with a, a true immunologist and uh, studying T cell biology and antigen presentation. And so he came, he was very interested. Actually, our initial question uh, was not what we ended up publishing and, and we're still quite interested in it. But his initial question was, could some of those ERVs um, that we found that were derepressed in this cell state um, actually be displayed as peptides? Could, could this uh, promote an immunogenic cell state to have endogenous retroviral peptides um, being presented in the cell state. And so to do this, I, I then collaborated again with a true immunologist, Ellis Reinhertz um, at Dana-Farber, who really is one of the fathers of immunology, um, who back with Stu Schlossman in the late 70s identified CD4 and CD8 um, through antibody purification. And then later in his lab actually was the first to pull down the T-cell receptor in human uh, in human T cells. 
Um, and so he's developed now, he's still working actively and, and basically developed a way to immunoprecipitate MHC class one, um, and then basically elude off the peptides and then run mass spec. And again, our initial question was, if we synthesize candidate peptides from those ERVs, can we now detect in this mesenchymal state uh, these ERV peptides? And unfortunately, like I said, uh, our first attempt didn't work. Um, however, um, what Ellis's lab noticed very strikingly is that in this neuro neuroendocrine cell state, there was first of all a, a major dearth um, of peptides. Um, and they would sporadically see um, some peptides that were presented and basically every peptide that they saw that ended up getting presented um, had known sequences to them of signal peptides. Uh, and again, this is where then I had to go back to my college uh, 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 biology, uh, but this is actually a very well-known uh, phenomenon that um, the way that cytosolic proteins end up on MHC class one is that they have to make it into the endoplasmic reticulum. So they get degraded by the proteasome and then the peptides actually have to be imported through this thing called TAP to get into the ER and to be loaded on um, to class one. So that if you have a defect um, in TAP, basically you, what, what's happening is you're not getting any peptides in there. And actually the reason you don't see much MHC class one is because MHC gets destabilized. However, there's another set of peptides that even without TAP, when you have low TAP levels, um, can still get presented, and these are signal peptides. And as you may recall, pre-pro insulin, all these things are sort of leader peptides, because they're destined to get secreted, um, that these are getting cleaved by signal peptides already in the ER, and so they can still get presented. And so basically, what Ellis's lab told us is, oh, this is boring. Um, this means TAP is mutated uh, in this cell line. And indeed, uh, I was very surprised. Um, I hadn't even been familiar with this literature and, and all the people studying checkpoint blockade and small cell uh, really don't seem to have recalled this literature. Then in the, in the 1990s, um, Nick Restifo, um, David Carbone basically showed that small cell lung cancer um, rarely ever expresses MHC class one. Um, and in fact, they had even linked it at the time uh, to TAP1. So, so this kind of explains why if you have a high tumor mutation burden and you're not at displaying any of your peptides, why you actually may have a poor response to um, checkpoint blockade. Um, but so where we became uh, excited, however, and where Ellis's lab also became excited is when we then looked in these different cell states. So here again, in the neuroendocrine cell state, we saw very rare peptides. They were all signal peptides. But what was very clear is this couldn't have been a mutation. Because if we took these same cell populations, the mixed population I mentioned, or this pure mesenchymal PDL1 high population, we recovered everything. Um, so when we actually looked at all the HLAA2 uh, pep associated peptides or the reference data set, they were all back. Um, and so while we couldn't find the, those initial ERB peptides in this data set, what this said is that there's something very interesting happening about epigenetic plasticity around um, likely TAP. Um, and so the first thing Naveen then did was to just validate this um, by looking at global MHC class one, because we hadn't done this before. We had only looked at the um, PDL1 levels. And you can see this basically matched what I told you about PDL1, that the neuroendocrine cells had very little. This is a pan, an HLA ABC antibody, uh, basically looked like the isotype control, whereas the H69M had this dual population, some that looked like the control, and then this outlier. Uh, uh, population. And if you plot this by flow versus the PDL1, what you can see is that this outlier MHC restored population is the same mesenchymal population that also restored PDL1. Uh, and so now getting into sort of the pathology um, aspects of this, at the same time, we have been working with Bristol Myers Squibb as part of the ION uh, network and um, Scott Rodig uh, here in, mole in molecular. Uh, pathology who had a, also an interest in MHC class one. And we said, let's just go back now then and take a large panel of small cell lung cancers and stain for MHC class one. Because I mentioned this had been done somewhat in the 80s and 90s, but on, on kind of sporadic cases, but we want to kind of look systematically now in the immune checkpoint era at MHC one levels. And so here is classic small cell lung cancer. Um, again, I'm not a pathologist, um, but has this sort of nested architecture. 
Um, and basically what you can, but you can see the stromal components. And if you stain for MHC1, you can see that in the stroma and in infiltrating immune cells, you see very nice um, positive control staining, but basically absence. And again, to Scott Rodick, who looked at this in melanoma, this was as black and white as he had um, seen. And so when we looked over a large set of cases, and I'll get into why we, how we selected these cases, because I think this is critical in sort of defining um, this sort of so-called atypical small cell, um, but that these were all pathology-defined small cell cases that the majority of them look like this um, and basically had a very low H score for MHC class one in tumor cells. However, there was a subset um, that actually had very high tumor cell MHC class one. And here you can see it. It's got very clear um, um, uh, membrane staining. And you can see you sort of lose this nested architecture. And um, as Lynette Scholl and Naveen often mentioned that there are these cases of small cell that are really defined morphologically, but are somewhat atypical and um, they also tend to have a um, more eosinophilic cytoplasm, which you can see here. Um, and as I'll show you, they actually have less of the, the uh, markers of small cell, the synaptophysin and chromogranin. Um, but why we knew these had to be small cell lung cancers too is that you could find them in pockets of the MHC low tumor. So if you look very carefully, right sitting right next to um, this MHC low classic small cell morphology, you could see the same um, uh, cell morphology with, this is a higher magnification that has slightly more eosinophilic cytoplasm and had completely recovered uh, MHC uh, class one, suggesting plasticity within tumors. And so getting back to the neuroendocrine markers and, and really some of the validation to really prove, we, we had to really prove that these weren't just sort of non-small cell cases that were MHC high. All of them were RB negative, which is a, uh, the, the ones that we had, had, um, and there was actually one case though that, that um, was RB positive and excluded that. But basically we stained all of these cases for both INSM1, which is really a, so now becoming a very robust canonical marker of neuroendocrine cell state. Um, and you can see that in the MHC high or MHC lows, the, the tumor cells were purple for INSM1. Whereas if you stain for RB, um, you see RB in the stroma intact, but lost in the tumor. Um, and this is just to show that um, this is the MHC high case, so that in, in white, you can see that in this context, you see uh, MHC one is high as opposed to our MHC low. But what was very interesting is we then start to look at these other um, transcription factor states that have been just defined um, in small cell. And I can tell you that it's not as clean as what is advertised by uh, transcriptional signatures, that really the only one that was somewhat robust was ASCL1. Um, and that we could see a very strong um, uh, correlation um, that ASCL1 uh, was high in this tumor type that really looked like classic small cell and maintained the neuroendocrine phenotype and had low class one. And also um, these were the cases where, and I know I, I as, a, as a clinic practicing oncologist will see some of these cases where the you know, chromogranin um, basically here in this MHC high case is kind of sporadically uh, positive. And so basically what was happening is that these, um, these MHC low cases um, basically had a high ASCL1 um, um, uh, um, and high chromogranin, whereas the MHC high cases um, basically had very low um, uh, chromogranin and low uh, ASCL1. So kind of hinting at what we were seeing with this eosinophilic cytoplasm and sort of lack of neuro differentiation, we could track uh, with these neuroendocrine cell state markers, namely ASCL1. So then the next question to us was, um, does, could this actually correlate with checkpoint blockade uh, response? And so to do this, we went back uh, to Dana-Farber and we later integrated this with one of the checkmate studies with BMS, um, but we really want to focus not on the first line therapy because that's confounded by the chemo um, that's also given and sort of what is your definition? You have to wait basically for disease-free su survival past a year or longer. Here, what we did was we took refractory patients that had failed uh, chemo and really focused on these exceptional responders, patients that were failing, got often in these cases, nevo ipi, um, and then had these miraculous responses that again, we see in non-small cell somewhat frequently, but rarely ever see. And so, so basically we only had like five to six cases because one of these uh, was added from the, two of these were from the BMS cohort, but really Dana-Farber, over the past five years, we had five exceptional responders, which again highlights how rare this is in small cell. But what was 
very striking was that these uh, durable responders, um, not perfect, uh, but very strongly enriched uh, for the MHC high phenotype. And it makes quite a bit of sense that if you're MHC low, um, the, there may be the opportunity to overcome this, um, um, but that really, again, you need to present antigens in order to be recognized by the immune system. Okay, so in the last um, bit, um, we, we then wanted to go into sort of mechanism um, as well as potential therapeutic strategies for the bulk of patients that don't have MHC uh, class one. And so, um, as I mentioned, um, Israel in my lab had, had brought this model system, this very convenient model system of uh, a neuroendocrine cell line with this attached mesenchymal derivative. And we had actually already done some chip seek um, looking uh, at uh, ERVs um, as part of our prior paper um, to see that this low EZH2 cell state, um, basically uh, around these ERV containing loci, basically had um, decreased, uh, sorry, had uh, increased um, HVK27 acetylation. Um, but we had actually had trimethylation data too. And so what Naveen wanted to do was very systematically just look at all loci between these cell states, what's actually happening at the epigenetic level. And so as you may be familiar, EZH2 is a trimethyl, uh, you methylates um, and creates HVK27 trimethylation. So if um, this is a repressive mark. And so when this is lost, you can now have the opportunity to acetyl, uh, acetylate the locus. So we were very interested that globally in this mesenchymal cell state, which loci had decreased trimethylation and increased um, acetylation. And basically we set these cutoffs and led um, at, the, at the epigenetic level, this set of genes. And one that we were very interested in uh, that I believe your group also has also um, focused on is YAP1. Um, and in vitro, this is a very robust marker of this mesenchymal cell state. But the one that we had also seen previously um, that we've been quite interested in is also Axel, which has um, been implicated in the melanoma literature um, in a very similar context where MITF1, like ASCL1, um, mediates the melanocyte um, differentiation uh, program. And when MITF1 is downregulated with resistance, um, there's this axle positive resistance state. So we're also very interested in this. And then what was very nice and reassuring to us is that in this sort of unbiased analysis, TAP1 uh, uh, was one of the loci uh, that, that came out of this. Um, and so what we then did was we um, basically use RNA-seq, sorry, um, to filter this list. So, so, so these genes were not only at the epigenetic level derepressed um, in this cell state, but they're also overexpressed by RNA-seq. But we then set a very stringent filter and looked at our tumor data. Um, so it, we had a subset of those MH, those tumor data that I showed you that, again, BMS had provided us those cases, and we had been able to do RNA-seq on a subset of those. That, and comparing the MHC high versus low, we want to see which of those genes from the cell lines actually validated inpatient tumors. And here, um, and we also tried staining um, again in these cases uh, for YAP1, because we very much wanted this to work. Uh, but really, both at the RNA level and by IHC, we could not see strong YAP1 staining, um, at least in, the, in our, in our um, MHC high co defined cohort of cases. But what we did see was Axel. Um, um, and um, what was also reassuring to us is that there was a uh, another paper that came out in Cancer Cell um, this year that also showed that Axel can mark um, this cell state. And then also very nicely in this completely unbiased analysis, TAP1 was one of the top genes that validated in the tumors as well. Um, and so kind of flying through this part, um, um, we, we focused on the TAP1 locus because what I showed you is this, this robust finding um, by the peptidome. Um, you could see that here um, it's not acetylated, um, doesn't have the acetyl active mark in the H69, then the H69M, it's recovered. Um, you can see that then the trimethylation, trimethylation is a little bit messier um, because it's more um, broad, but you can see it's got broadly higher um, quant quantities over this range. Uh, compared to the H69M. And then just looking at messenger RNA levels, uh, you can see that clearly this correlated with TAP1 re-expression in the H69M uh, phenotype. And so, you know, most of what I've shown you is all in one cell line model. Um, so we then wanted to go across multiple different cell lines. And we looked at a series of neuroendocrine cell lines, small cell versus attached 
um, small cells, and you can see that the flow data fit. Basically, the neuroendocrine cells had low class one, whereas the mesenchymal cells had recovered this, and this correlated with TAP1 derepression. This also correlated with TAP1 protein um, recovery in these mesenchymal cells, and also inversely correlated with global H3K27 trimethylation. And so, um, as I've alluded to now several times, we had found that EZH2 was high in the neuroendocrine cell state and down in the mesenchymal state. And you can see here, this matches. Um, we wanted to look more globally. Um, could there be some relationship with EZH2 and TAP1 in small cell? And indeed, what we found is that if you just look in the CCLE, um, that EZH, this, is only, this only holds within small cell, not actually within non-small cell. But within small cell, um, that high expressing EZH2 lines have low TAP1, uh, whereas um, low expressing EZH2 cell lines have high TAP1. And then when you actually look at whether these are classified as adherent or suspension, you can see that these are largely classified as um, suspension and neuroendocrine, where these are adherent. Um, and, I, and what we also showed previously is that these are axle, these recover axle positivity as well. Okay, so basically what we found is that, um, you know, following up on what we found with ERVs in this cell state um, is that TAP1 and STING are epigenetically silenced um, in small cell lung cancer um, and that this results in defective MHC1-associated antigen presentation in the majority of small cell lung cancer patients. Um, however, there is this subset of axle-positive non-neuroendocrine small cell that can recover MHC1, and I'll show you also sting, and that this could be responsible for the rare durable responders to checkpoint um, block, blockade. Um, and so we're very interested in now validating this and have developed with Lynette Scholl a clinical MHC1 um, assay. Okay, so finally, um, to, to the therapeutic uh, implications, um, well, what about the majority of patients that don't um, express this. What about using an EZH2 inhibitor to flip cells into the state? And we had actually tried this previously for Israel's work, but we're treating with continuous EZH2 inhibition. And the problem with continuous EZH2 inhibition is that it's uh, toxic. Um, and the other issue um, is that if we just did short-term EZH2 inhibition, it wasn't sufficient um, to derepress TAP1. We still had to add interferon. However, what Naveen um, and a, actually a high school student in the lab fortuitously found is that when they treated for one week uh, this cell line with uh, a variety of different EZH2 inhibitors and then withdrew the drug, now we started to derive, starting at about two weeks later, um, the same cell state that had happened with uh, HGF, where the cells sort of recover from EZH2 inhibition, but then all sit down onto the plate. Um, in this mesenchymal phenotype. And we called these H69EZ cells, and we did it with a GSK EZH2 inhibitor, Constellation one, and several other ones. And what was very interesting about this cell state is that they were now axle positive, um, which I'm not showing you, but by sick gene expression signatures, they had EMT signature, signatures and were axle positive by immunoblot and had spontaneous interferon signaling. Um, and they looked very much like, um, in terms of the ERV response, uh, derepressing these ERVs and expressing baseline cytokines and chemokines like this H69M cell state. However, what you'll see is that even though we've created this cell state, and we mentioned this previously in our previous work for H69M, many of the cytokines, like I told you with the KRAS LKV1, are not simply the ones that we want, which are CXCL10. Actually, in the small cell state, in this mesenchymal state, there was this very strong, um, in addition to the IRF3, um, NF-kappa B component and activation of um, IL-6. So another postdoc in the lab, uh, Eric Knelson, um, who's been very focused on using sting agonists um, to take these mesenchymal-like cells, uh, because we think these cells in particular may be prone to treatment with these cyclic dinucleotide sting agonists, um, so this is the Aduro um, uh, sting agonist. Um, and so what happens is we, when he treats the neuroendocrine cells that don't have sting, you can basically see that they don't respond in terms of this very important T-cell chemokine uh, that I mentioned. But what he had found is that this mesenchymal cell line, the derepressed sting, was highly sensitive. So basically what you could do, very much like what I showed you when you activate sting in LKV1, 
is take the low level of CXCL10 there and drive very co-op the sting positivity and drive high level CXCL10. And what was nice is that this EZ cell line, uh, we could do the same thing. Um, and also in other cell lines, this is a mesenchymal attached cell line that had sting. We see the same phenotype as another neuroendocrine cell line. We don't see the same thing. Furthermore, if you knock out sting um, in these cell lines, this, inter this interferon signaling that's happening down in sting is actually contributing to the MHC class one. So, so basically what we, the model that we came up with is not only is TAP1 important um, for the peptide transport into the ER, but actually the interferon signaling to drive gene expression of MHC class one downstream of sting um, is also important. So um, this led us to the therapeutic concept of combining an EZH2 inhibitor followed by a sting agonist to prime this. Um, and so to do this um, in the last five minutes, uh, we used a um, syngeneic mouse model that was developed by Matt Ozer, um, uh, a recent PI at Dana-Farber who had worked with Bill Kalin. And he generated a syngeneic model of small cell lung cancer by deleting RB, P130, and P53 in a pure background. And he had derived cell lines from these lung cancers, mouse lung cancers. And what Eric had done was test, can he derive the same uh, attached versus suspension cell lines and indeed he could. We call these RPPA to avoid confusion because there's this other RPPM model that exists. So A means attached in this case. And what was very gratifying is that if you look at MHC class one in the mouse, you see the exact same thing. So the mouse has two different uh, MHC in this background, the, the black six, these KB and DB. And you can see that the RPPA attached basically recovered uh, MHC class one, whereas the pure neuroendocrine lacked class one. Um, what was also nice, is that now you can use antigens, uh, very mo model antigens in this model. And so if you now put this ovalbumin antigen and then try to take a T cell, this OT1 T cell that can kill ova presenting cells, the neuroendocrine cells were not killed just even with high effector target ratios, whereas the, the um, attached cells were now actually displaying um, the ovalbumin peptide. And then most importantly, when we implanted these in mice, um, what you could see is that if you have an intact immune system, the neuroendocrine cells could form, but to our surprise, this pure mesenchymal cell line um, that had high sting, um, had very strong antigen presentation, even without any sort of exogenous treatment, formed and then was rejected. And, and we knew this was rejection because if you put this in a non, uh, NSG mouse, they could, the, the mice could still form, and you could see that these, these tumors become heavily uh, uh, infiltrated. Um, and so in the interest of time, I'm gonna skip this part, but I'm happy to talk about it further. It's in our paper, but we actually did single cell RNA sequencing of these infiltrates. Um, and what very interestingly we could find is that in the model that was rejected, there was not only CD8 predominance, but actually there was a single TCR here um, that represented um, when we add up this one and this one, um, over 12% um, of all T cells. And this suggests that this TCR might actually be recognizing the A tumor antigen in these cells. Um, and so we actually made this TCR. We, we put it into a T cell and we then co-cultured it with the attached cells. And indeed this TCR that we pulled out of the mouse could be stimulated only by the attached um, uh, cell population. So we're very interested in kind of using this model to go back to our original question. Could this be an ERV antigen in the mouse? Um, that is derepressed, um, or is it some other antigen? To really get, get to the biology of the next level is the, sort of what are the immunogenic antigens that are being uncovered in this cell state. Um, but finally, um, what we did was um, to do this therapeutic study, which was to treat with an EZH2 inhibitor to generate this cell state and then treat with um, sting agonism. And so what you can see is that um, EZH2 inhibition alone was not enough. Um, it did by developing this mesenchymal state um, it didn't behave as robustly as that pure mesenchymal state. In other words, it wasn't spontaneously rejected. Tumors did grow slower. Um, there was some delay and some that had kind of substantial delay, but basically um, all 10 mice uh, recovered. With sting agonist injection alone, um, we could get response. And so even though this is the neuroendocrine state, if you drive a very potent interferon response in the mouse, um, we could actually get some response. But again, what you'll see is that only two out of the 10 of these mice actually had 
cure, um, that, that eventually after time, almost all these mice relapse. But what was very exciting to see, um, what is in, in contrast is that in this EZH2 prime state that now, um, and I think you know, another point is that a lot of mouse studies that you see don't really show this, um, which is actually durable cure, which really is I think required to prove that there's actually T cell mediated um, um, immune responses. And so with this combination, we weren't just seeing a, a delay in tumor growth. We actually saw six out of 10 mice were, were cured. Um, and this basically led to the survival uh, uh, curve. Um, and so the hope is that in patients, if we could develop a strategy that even in refractory patients, um, that pulsing with an EZH2 inhibitor and then using some approach to drive sting agonism uh, might do the same thing. So finally, um, uh, what I hope I've shown you is that these two tumor cell types that um, are notoriously resistant to checkpoint um, blockade both silence tumor cell sting. And what um, something I'm very interested in sort of conceptually and moving again beyond this hot versus cold um, nomenclature is really framing what actually happens, which is um, the immune editing process um, that happens before we ever even detect tumors. And so what we think is happening is actually that this evolution as the tumor's forming, rather than putting up pdl one uh, to shield itself from the immune editing process, that basically these tumors are silencing sting um, and preventing T cell infiltration. Thus, since they're both high tumor TMB tumors and have a lot of tumor antigens or may have ERV antigens, it's very hopeful and possible that if you break this uh, cycle, um, that actually in patients, you will generate spontaneous uh, immune responses um, against antigens that have never been seen by the immune system. Um, and so in small cell lung cancer, this is linked to robust silencing of the MHC1 antigen presentation machinery that's connected with silencing of TAP together with sting that we've shown, I've shown you that EZH2 inhibition, it can uncover this immunogenic uh, phenotype, but requires sting agonism to really maximize it. Um, and that um, where we're headed next, and Naveen, um, who's interested in starting his own lab, is really to define at a granular level, especially in small cell lung cancer, what are these actual antigens? The question he was interested in first, are they ERV derived? Something we're very interested in is also that there may be oncofetal antigens um, that are now uh, uncovered. So um, yes, neoantigens are all the rage, um, um, but it's very possible there may be these kind of universal tumor associated antigens that get unveiled um, in this cell state. Um, and so finally, I just want to highlight um, Naveen again, um, who did most of the work in the small cell, and Eric, who led the work um, really in uncovering the durable response um, and the um, sting agonism. Marco Campisi, who led the, who's developing the microvascular network model, and Shinsuke, who has led all the LKB1 work, um, as well as all of our collaborators um, and my funding. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Abrabi. Uh, what an excellent talk. And it always amazes me how uh, one can summarize a decade's worth of work in uh, 45 minutes. Uh, before we proceed and ask you some questions, the first one already popped up. If you do have any questions in the audience, please use the Q&A feature located at the bottom of your screen. If you don't see it, uh, try the three dots that says more. And while we wait on additional questions, I just wanted to uh, mention that next week we will hear from uh, Dr. Jonathan Strasberg from Moffitt, uh, who will be presenting advances in treatment of metastatic neuroendocrine tumors. Uh, to view all upcoming Winship Grand Round lectures, please visit the Grand Rounds page on the Winship Cancer Center website or the uh, Winship calendar. Uh, so let's go ahead. And uh, your first questions come from the uh, Walla Lab. And uh, I believe you can see it too, Dr. Barbie. Uh, uh, Nat Waller uh, compliments uh, very nice work. As you have found that, uh, I, I wonder if that means small cell lung cancer is heterogeneous based upon epigenetic modifications of gene expression. Why doesn't immunotherapy of small cell lung cancer in patients with axial positive mesenchymal subset lead to a selection of an EZH2 expressing TAP1 low population? That's a great question. And so the way I would think of it is that this, this um, cell type that we just found that led, led to the durable response, at least in the analysis that we've uh, done, I would think of that more like non-small cell lung cancer. 
um, high, high TMB non-small cell lung cancer, where you see these same checkpoint blockade responses. And what I would argue that in those patients, when people are studying acquired resistance, we are seeing a very similar phenotype. What's been described um, in that case is um, sort of LOH of HLAs. So that whereas you have sort of the diversity of different HLAs, all the different alleles, that basically you lose specific HLA alleles as the tumors evolve. There's also been in that case, B2M silencing and melanoma B2M silencing. So there is a selective pressure in non-small cell lung cancer melanoma to do this exact same thing. In small cell lung cancer, the reason um, we haven't seen it is we don't know um, that because there's such rare patients that actually do respond, I just don't think it's been well studied um, that, um, that, you know, at least we haven't of, of those durable responders, we haven't gone back and done say repeat biopsies and repeat analyses of the ultimate uh, escapers. But I would predict that you're, that you're exactly right, that there are gonna be escapers and it's gonna be the same selective pressure but I might predict it's like the non-small cell, that if there are tumor antigens, specific tumor antigens that are being recognized, that it may be a more specific sort of HLA loss um, that's allowing cells to escape those, those immune responses. Excellent. Uh, thank you. Um, I don't see an additional question, so I'm going to ask one, okay? So I'm a pathologist, <laughs> and uh, uh, this is all everything you do happens uh, after, after what I do, and that is classify these tumors, right, into, into carcinoids, uh, small cell carcinomas, large cell neuronecking carcinomas. So over the recent five to 10 years, we have seen more and more subclassification, and you mentioned the transcription factors in, in small cell carcinomas in, in different types. Uh, uh, you did not mention the uh, POUs 2 f 3 subtype that is, that is also a, a not neuroendocrine marking uh, small cell carcinoma, but doesn't look quite as uh, a mesenchymal. But at, at the lower uh, grade spectrum, uh, we know that these spindle cell carcinoids right, uh, be, behave worse often and are more aggressive tumors. So I wonder if you have looked at those and see if they fall maybe into that uh, subset of mesenchymal looking small cell carcinomas. It's a great question, and I think you know a, a variety of other people are now looking at this in both prostate neuro, and so the neuroendocrine transformed in the opposite uh, uh, direction in neuroblastoma. Um, there's actually a paper that's in the that, that basically shows this this phenotype is confer, can, that when you have pure neuroendocrine differentiation, you get silencing of the antigen presentation machinery, whereas in more mesenchymal, you recover it. But in terms of carcinoid, we haven't done it, so it's a great project actually. Again, the the other reason you know that again. The, the tr this transcription, my caution with that mesh signatures um, and in vitro uh, uh, cell line data is that, that, um, that there can be artifacts. You know, transcription does not lead to actually protein expression and in vitro can also be an artifact. So the reason I didn't mention the neuro D1 and the others is we tried that very hard actually and they're not clean. That if you actually, and there's actually a paper that came out from Charlie Rudin and others that if you do actual multiplexed IF with those panels, it's not as clean as what's sort of in that canonical paper. Um, the ASCL1 is, but MHC1 is. Uh, and so the cleanest marker is MHC1. So yeah, to answer your question, it'd be a very simple study to just you know take this validated MHC1 assay if you have a set of cases and stain. Lynette and Mari will have a, case, a set of cases, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so it'd be interesting to collaborate on that. <laughs> And on the other end, since there's no more question in the in the box, and I'm seeing right now, uh, not in the chat either. You know, the other end is large cell neuronecking carcinoma, right, which has small cell-like subsets and uh, and large cell-like subsets. So, as a pathologist, I wonder how close do you think we are uh, toppling this whole small cell, non-small cell dogma in the neuroendocrine world, and just going with different descriptors and predictors for treatment. How, how close are we? How close are we? Five, five years, 10 years, 20 years? Yeah, and, one, and there's also a, a Marina Vivero who's here. Um, she's very interested in this question. And I know a lot of people have been looking at genomics. So I think to me, it's a genomics that, that there are these, there are a subset of large cell neuroendocrines that don't have the classic RBE P53. Those often can be KRAS and LKV1 mutant actually. Um, that basically are so poorly differentiated that they start to engage some of these neuroendocrine programs. And, and I, what I would say is that those may be also YAP positive. 
um, that, that, that if you start to include those that are more not really non-small cell in etiology, in genomic etiology, um, uh, that that's a separate. But uh, yeah, what I, I guess what I would define is by genomics, that if you have the classic RB P53 mutated cell state as a minimum, um, that yeah, that basically what Naledad Naled and, and, uh, and Naveen are thinking is that, again, that this, some people might call this large cell what I showed you, that there's more cytoplasm, but that really is more on the small cell spectrum um, in terms of its behavior. Right. So I think genomically, yeah, ge uh, in uh, genomics, and maybe, yeah, yeah, maybe, for example, YAP could be a marker that, because we really think YAP is not positive in this type that we're looking at. Mm -hmm. Excellent, thank you. So I do not see any more questions in the question and answer box. Uh, if anyone has any burning questions, uh, put them in real quick or raise your hand. Uh, maybe we can even if someone's on the car, there is one. Okay, Maria Ribeiro. Uh, thank you. I practice oncology at the Atlanta VA and we see a lot of patients with resistant disease. And this is the reason that we are so interested in this. Yeah, Definitely. there's a lot of people interested in this, I'm sure. <laughs> And uh, thanks to you, we, we hopefully get a handle on this uh, rather sooner rather than later. Yeah, and I take care of these patients too. And yeah, this is also why I do this. Yeah. It's, and it's not, and, it's and yeah, if you read your reviews, uh, and apparently they all love you. So, <laughs> And uh, we do too, and greatly appreciate you here. We don't want to hold you hostage any longer. So there's no more questions. We're at the top of the hour. I'm sure you have to move on to your patients and everyone in the audience to theirs. Uh, so again, Thank you very much for joining us this morning. Uh, very great work and uh, appreciate your coming and talking to us. Thank you so much. All right, bye.